It's Tuesday, so you know what that means. It's time for another top 10 video. This time we'll be talking about the top 10 magic items for the D&D 5e Monk. If you want to see the rules and all the specifics behind this, stay tuned. So before we dive into the specifics, I wanted to apologize. As look, you can see it's technically Wednesday, so sorry about that. But I also wanted to talk to you about a sponsor for today's video, and that is the team over at Aventier Games. We've worked with them in the past. They're an absolute pleasure to work with, and they churn out amazing, wonderful content. And that is the case in Heretic's Guide to Devotions and Divinity. It's no secret that I love divine characters, clerics and paladins. You can see the numbers are rising right here. Clerics and paladins are some of my favorite classes to play in 5th edition. And I love running things for divine characters because I think there's so much you can do and so much opportunity for great role play where you have someone who has a devotion to a higher power or, or an, whether it be an oath or a god or what have you. So if you were a huge fan of books like uh, Complete Divine, things like that, from, or the book, even the old versions of the Book of Exalted Deeds that were physical books you could have in older editions. This seems to be, in my opinion, a spiritual successor to both of those books combined into one, providing everything you could want for running a game for a divine character. There are a ton of different tiers, things that'll get you even things like physical rewards, things like miniatures, files, pins, cards. $25 is the base level, and that'll get you access to the PDF as well as virtual tabletop ready maps, and that will be available to you as soon as February of next year with a hardcover coming for uh, a little bit later in May of 2023. So it's not even just stuff that could necessarily be used for a divine uh, player, but there's obviously a lot more to it. Uh, it has stats for gods, avatars. They have over 30 new celestial creatures contained within the book. They have all sorts of different options. There's also a 20-page free sample you can click and download, and that gives you a really good idea of what you're going to be looking at. They have things like relic hunts, which I think is a really cool concept. So basically, like, search for the Holy Grail concept things for these relic-style uh, ritual items for relig uh, you know religious characters. Or, again, a treasure hunting party. Uh, if you pledge in the first 48 hours, which it did just launch just this morning, you receive adventure PDF uh Pack 3, featuring two 5th edition adventures, The Priest's Sorrow and The Abyss, uh, Abbess's Revenge. Sorry. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You'll just get that if you back it between now and I think the next tomorrow will be uh, 24 hours. So I guess between now and Friday. Uh, but yeah, it's all sorts of different options here. You can click through and take a look at this. I really like that they brought back the concept of the old oaths from other books where this is not something for just a paladin. You could take thing like an oath of mercy or an oath of poverty and basically relinquish something from your character in in favor of getting some sort of benefit. Like again, you can see oath of poverty. It'll give you some benefits, but you basically can't have physical possessions, right? You break your oath when you own or use currency of any object that has a value of more than one gold piece. So you're forsaking material goods in benef for other benefits. Again, thank you to Aventier Games for sponsoring this video. I highly recommend you check out this Kickstarter. There'll be a link in the top of the video description as well as the pinned comment. So jumping on to the specifics uh, for this monk video, you know what I'm going to talk about, but... We're not going to be covering any legendary magic items, just common, rare, and very rare magic items. Uh, no legendaries. Also, as with all of these videos, they should be paired with the original video that started off the revitalization of this series, Top 10 Magic Items for all classes, right? Because you have those 10 magic items, and then these ones are specific. So the 10 that can be applicable to all classes should be considered when you're playing any class in 5th edition. Uh, also, we won't be doing any consumable magic items, so no potions, no scrolls, also no magic items that have a limited number of charges that don't recharge, something, again, I use the chime of opening as an example where it expends the uses, and then it's gone when it's done. Uh, we are also doing this in a subclass agnostic situation where we're not going to be saying like, oh, if you happen to play this particular monk subclass, this magic item will be really, really good for you. Uh, again, for example, if you happen to play uh, as a monk, for example, a subclass that lets you cast a spell, then you are technically considered a spell caster for the terms of uh, the purposes of attuning to and being able to use certain magic items. So this is subclass agnostic. And I will tell you up front, it was actually kind of difficult to come up with 10 magic items for a monk, not including the 10 in that, which most of the 
10 magic items for all classes were a large majority of what uh, were in my original video from a couple years ago. But anyway, let's dive in. Number 10. The Ring of Free Action. This rare attunement magic item comes to us from the, the base rules, and it makes difficult terrain not cost extra movement for you. In addition, magic can neither reduce your speed nor cause you to be paralyzed or restrained. As a monk, you are zipping around the battlefield. You also have a lot of movement and potentially different movement options depending on the subclass that you are. So being able to maneuver around the battlefield is important for you. And you do get a lot of really tough built-in uh, resistances to a lot of things, you know, immunity to poison and disease, eventually proficiency with all saving throws. So you have a lot of things going for you in that respect, but still being paralyzed or restrained will shut down. I mean, again, some of those even leading to auto crits on you if people are able to hit you. Uh, and then again, hampering your movement is something you don't want. So this is... Uh, I've actually played a monk a handful of times in 5th edition, and I was able to get access to this ring, uh, at least on one of them, and it was a game changer for me. It allowed me to do so much more. The only thing, unfortunately, it doesn't work is if something has a natural means of poisoning, or, or sorry, paralyzing or restraining you, like something with ropes or tentacles that can restrain you. It only specifically functions with magic. I do feel like it should work on that as well, but either way. Number nine. The Mantle of Spell Resistance. This rare attunement magic item also comes to us from the basic rules. And while again, eventually at level 14 as a monk, you will have proficiency with every single saving throw, having advantage on saving throws against spells from this cloak is going to be useful, especially because not a lot of folks, one, get to level 14. I was actually nice enough to benefit from both of the times that I've played a monk in 5th edition. We got to at least that level, so I got to for a short time, experience what it's like to have proficiency in all saving throws. But even still, that proficiency is nice, but it still will be hampered by however high you're able to get your ability scores. So being able to rely on advantage on saving throws against spells is pretty useful. We talked about the ring of free action in the last uh, one here, which again, this in theory could help you there. If you had to get only one, the mantle of spell resistance would actually provide you advantage on the saving throws versus, you know, paralyze uh, or restrain. So possibly if you had to get one, I'd probably lean more towards the mantle of spell resistance as it has more applicable things. I mean, you also have the benefit of having evasion. So dexterity saving throws could not become a problem for you too much, but having advantage so that you're guaranteed to maybe make that dexterity saving throw, thus taking no damage it really, it's just a really solid magic item, and this was actually a runner-up for top 10 magic items that should be uh, applicable to all, so, uh, all classes. Number eight. The Shadowfell brand magical tattoo. This rare attunement uh, magic item comes to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I'll give you a warning up front. Tattoos are going to show up quite a bit on this list. And that's because of the kind of limitations that monks have, right? You're not wielding a sh shield. You can't wear armor. Uh, you, more often than not, depending on what you are, are going to be focusing on unarmed strikes, maybe a weapon, but you're even limited in what weapons you can use. So the tattoos actually worked really well as something that monks could gain access to. Uh, and I always like the concept of the tattooed monk from older editions, so it just fits in my mind. So this gives you dark vision out to 60 feet, which again, maybe you already have dark vision, so it's not as useful for you, but it does give you advantage on stealth checks, which is just a common, like the two going together, interesting choice. I would have liked to have seen if you have dark vision, it extends it by a further amount, but either way, gives the opportunity to play a race that doesn't have dark vision. And then again, the extension uh, advantage on stealth checks is huge, and that would be almost enough as it is, but then you also get shadowy defense. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to become insubstantial for a moment, having the damage you take. That can't be used again until the next sunset. As I mentioned previously, right, you have proficiency in multiple saving throws. Uh, you'll have evasion. So for an instance where you perhaps don't have an ability to negate that damage easily, you can, uh, and it's whenever you take damage, right? So this could be damage from any source, right? Typically fall damage you can reduce from, you know, slow fall, but you have a variety of different options here, right? This could be a weapon attack, uh, but 
it's just nice to have the options, right? If it's a missile attack, you can maybe deflect missiles, but if it's a spell that possibly you can't get out of with evasion, shadowy defense could be there to help kind of mitigate that for you. Number seven. The Life Well Tattoo, a very rare attunement magic item that, again, comes from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This one will give you resistance to necrotic damage, which is, again, an always-on nice thing to have. And the once-per-day ability when you go to zero hit points to pop up to one instead. As I've stated before, you are a monk. You are in the thick of it more often than not with a lot of the different subclass options. So being able to stay in the fight longer, and even if you don't have any key points left and you're just doing two attacks and your martial arts attack, that's potentially three hits, three options for fishing for crits, and three possible consistent sources of damage that your party can rely on if you're able to be in there hitting things. Not to mention the amount of you know, game-changing things you can do with Stunning Strike if you're able to make that happen. So you being able to keep hitting things is useful. And honestly, one hit point is as good as 100 hit points. So if you can stay in that fight for one round longer, you could drastically alter the way that combat goes. Again, I've expressed my issues with the Life Well tattoo. Some of the tattoos feel like the rarity is a little bit off. But either way, it's a useful one. The only problem you ultimately possibly run into is not having enough skin to have all of the tattoos on you based on the requirements that they have. Number six. The Eldritch Staff. This very rare magic item comes to us from Wild Beyond the Witchlight of all places. And again, one of the items and the weapons that a monk can use is a quarterstaff. And this does function as a plus one quarterstaff. So right there, you can use it as a weapon if you need to. And it also has some other benefits. It has a D6 plus four uh, charges return daily at dawn, of which it has 10 normally. And it has the sort of standard thing, don't expend the last charge. If you do, you might roll and possibly lose it. It has Eldritch Attack, which is when you hit with an attack with said staff, you can expend up to three of its charges for each charge that you expend. Uh, the target can take an extra D8 lightning damage, so that's only triggered on a hit, so you could possibly be adding an additional 3D8 lightning damage to a connection with the Eldritch Staff, which is pretty cool. Also, you could wait to utilize these charges until you crit, possibly doubling that 3D8 to 68, which is cool. And then it also has the Eldritch Escape feature at the end here. If you take damage while holding the staff, you can use your reaction to expend three charges, Whereupon you turn invisible and teleport yourself along with anything you're wearing or carrying up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space that you can see. You remain invisible until the start of your next turn or until you attack, cast a spell, or deal damage. So there's a lot of things you can do with that. It also gives you a reactionary use, which monks typically don't have anything other than like deflect missiles and opportunity attacks. And the fact that you also have so much movement typically as a monk, a 60-foot teleport could get you seriously out of danger, and then potentially you may be able to get right back in next turn after you've been able to reassess the situation. Uh, yeah, it's just, I, I feel like this is something that often gets overlooked because it comes from an adventure. Number five. Speaking of magic items from an adventure, we have the Insignia of Claws, the uncommon non-attunement magic item that comes to us from Horde of the Dragon Queen. Uh, basically, while wearing this, you have a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls you make with unarmed strikes and natural weapons. It also makes them magical. Again, as a monk, yours eventually will become magical as part of just leveling. So if you get this early on, it's also one of the only items on this list that is non-attunement. And for the longest time, it was the only way to get a bonus to your attack and damage rolls with unarmed strikes. So this is basically a quintessential monk item. Again, it lives in Horde of the Dragon Queen, which is a weird thing. Although I have seen this appear in Adventure League play uh, for different folks outside of just the Tyranny of Dragons storyline. So I highly recommend it, like, whenever you, if you're a DM and you've given any of your players in the campaign a plus one weapon... At any point, at around that same time, if you have a monk in the party, an insignia of claws should also be made available for them, as it basically is the equivalency of a plus one sword to them, but it allows them to use their unarmed strikes in such a way. Now again, you could give them a plus one quarter staff, sure, but their martial arts ability, which is their bonus action attack, is limited to only being an unarmed strike, 
So it kind of helps mitigate that or allowing them to, if they want to just focus purely on unarmed strikes, they won't be weakened in comparison. And I've seen this personally again from playing a monk where it's like, well, I'm only going to use my weapon as much as I can, even if I don't love the weapon that I'm using and I would rather focus on, you know, the descriptive combat of fighting hand to hand, but I'm actually hampered damage wise because I, why wouldn't I use my magic weapon? So I, I think the Insignia of Claws is a pretty standard option to give to a monk in your campaign. Number four. Now I know I just went on a tirade, sort of, mini tirade about unarmed strikes, but the Staff of Striking, another magic item uh, weapon for a monk. This uh, very rare tune and magic item comes to us from the basic rules. And the only reason that it's here kind of versus the Eldritch Staff is that this is a plus three quarter staff so that has a more consistent to hit bonus and a more consistent damage bonus than the eldritch staff would have it also has 10 charges uh, when you hit with a melee attack you can expend up to three of those charges to deal extra force damage uh, i have a d6 per charge spent and then again it also has the concept of the expend the charges if you spend the last one you can lose it pretty standard stuff so really, if you had to pick, it can go either way between this or the Eldritch Staff. I put Staff of Striking a little higher on the list because it has the consistent output of the extra to hit and damage of being a plus three weapon. Uh, also, force damage is a little, is pretty much almost resisted by almost nothing in the game, whereas lightning damage has more resistance to it, although the force damage is a little less. Uh, also, again, the Staff of Striking comes from the basic rules, and people may not use something like Wild Beyond the Witch Light to provide magic items from, so you stand a better chance of getting access to this in your game. Number three. The Bracers of Defense, you knew they had to be here, right? This is a rare attunement magic item that comes to us from the basic rules, and just gives you a plus two bonus to your armor class if you're not wearing armor or wielding a shield. Uh, again, as a monk, you typically can't wield armor or use a shield to get the benefits of your unarmed strike ability, so Bracers of Defense are one of the only options to do that. Again, a lot of people will think of Bracers of Defense on a Barbarian, but I will remind you that Barbarians technically can wield, they can wear armor, and they can wield shields, so they could get something like an animated shield, for example, and then still be able to wear armor if they wanted to. Uh, whereas the monks really only option to boost their armor class is again things like ring of cloak of protection or the bracers of defense number two the eldritch claw tattoo this uncommon attunement magic item comes to us again from tasha's cauldron of everything and outside of the insignia of claws this is the only other way that i know of off the top of my head to boost your mat your unarmed strike ability with a magic item. So it comes with the op, uh, the ability Magical Strikes, which is your unarmed strikes are now considered magical for the purposes of overcoming immunity and resistance, and they get a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls with unarmed strikes. So in theory, if you were to wear the Insignia of Claws and have the Eldritch Claw tattoo, you could net yourself a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls with your unarmed strikes. And if that wasn't enough, it also comes with the Eldritch Maw ability, which you can activate as a bonus action and lasts for a minute. For that duration, your melee attacks, uh, and you could also double this up with a weapon, um, uh, but you're also your unarmed strikes now have a reach of 15 feet and deal an additional d6 force damage on a hit. The most recent monk I played actually got the Eldritch Claw tattoo, so I had this personally, and I could tell you it is a game changer. Not only does the 15-foot reach provide you all sorts of opportunities to maneuver around the battlefield, but the extra D6 force damage on a hit is huge, especially once you're level 5 and could potentially be doing upwards with Flurry of Blows to 4 attacks a turn, 2 from attack an extra attack, and then 2 from Flurry of Blows. That means that each attack you were able to do, you could be dealing an extra 46 damage a turn. So you're, even though your damage output may be lower than something like a Paladin or a Rogue, you are able to hit potentially consistently and then have four opportunities to hit. If you hit all four attacks, you could be, at least if you're at level five, for example, be doing 2d6 per hit plus your dexterity modifier. Uh, again, that obviously will only increase as you level up. So I was able to get good use out of this magic item. And again, the bonus to the unarmed strike attack and damage rolls is all factored into this. And it's nice to be able to 
punch things, but not have to be literally in melee range of some of these enemies. Not to mention, you know, the funky stuff you could do with Sentinel and all sorts of crazy things you can have going on with it. I highly recommend the Eldritch Claw Tattoo, and it is only uncommon rarity. Number one. The Dragon Hide Belt. This varying attunement magic item uh, comes from to us from Fizban's Treasury of Dragons and is only attunable by a monk. It follows the format of a lot of the more recent magic items that we've seen in 5th edition, where it improves some sort of key DC or, or base function of your class uh, by a varying number based on its rarity. In this instance, uncommon, uncommon being plus one, rare being plus two, or very rare being plus three. And for the monk, the Dragon Hide Belt improves the saving throw DC of your key-based features. So for a lot of different monk subclasses, they'll have different abilities to manifest powers or different things that will use a key save DC, so it would improve that. It will also improve the basis of uh, core monk abilities. For example, Stunning Strike, what a lot of people consider to be one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful ability for the monk. Being able to improve your key save DC for that is just gravy there for you. You could do so much more with that. Again, as someone who has played a monk uh, up to multiple times up to high levels, uh, this would be huge for me. I actually lament the fact that I played a monk more recently, the Ascendant Dragon Monk, in a dragon-themed campaign and was never able to get access to the dragon hide belt for my character, though my DM had a plenty hard time surviving and succeeding on my stun, uh, stunning strike save DCs, so I think it was a choice to not give me this magic item so that he didn't have to have even harder time doing so. And if that wasn't enough, you also can use an action to regain key points with a roll equal to your martial arts die, which you can't use this ability again until the next dawn. Again, forgive me for saying this, but key points are key to playing a monk. Uh, a lot of your abilities are tied to your usage of key points, not just your core features like Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, Stunning Strike, but also a lot of the subclass abilities as well. So when you don't have key points, you are severely weakened in comparison to some other classes. Uh, so now you do get all of your key points back on a short rest, which is nice, but if you find yourself in combat and you're not at a high enough level where you get them when you start initiative, which I think is level 20, uh, you would need the ability to do so. It does suck that it uses up your whole action to get these key points back, but you know what? You could use some of those key points if you roll high, to say, do something like patient defense, to take the dodge action to kind of survive the turn and then reassess with what key points you have on the following turn. I also like this because that ability will actually just get stronger as you get stronger, as your martial arts die continues to grow as you level up. So again, a well-designed magic item. I would have liked, it's a bummer that this is kind of one of the only, if not the only magic item specifically for monks uh, which I'm pretty sure it is the only one that's attunement by a monk only. I'd like to see more of this. I'd like to see more of that concept in general expanded for all of the classes. So, yeah, I, I again, as someone who's played a monk before, I, I think this is a fantastic addition, and I would highly recommend that you give your players the opportunity to get one, possibly craft one, as, again, it's made out of dragon hide, and everybody always harvests monster bits. So, there you go. So anyway, folks, that is my top 10 magic items for the monk. Again, as someone who has played a monk relatively recently, as well as in the past, both with the same DM, I have a lot of experience there. And I do know a lot of people have issues with the monk. They think the monk is underpowered or weak. I can tell you again that that same DM did not seem to think that the monk was underpowered and or weak. Uh, I routinely wrecked a lot of combats with things like Stunning Strike or just consistent damage output and clever usage of key points. But either way, I will admit that certain things are, you know, it could possibly use a little more hit die, maybe go up to a D10 as you are someone that's supposed to be finding yourself more often than not in the middle of things in melee. Uh, also with lack, if you don't have enough key points, a lot of the newer subclasses have also made sure that your abilities use your key points. Uh, actually, some of them have not, and I do appreciate that because if everything is sapping on that one resource of key points, you will expend them relatively quickly, and then you will basically be unable to use a lot of the cool abilities of your class slash subclass. 
perhaps something as simple as just adding proficiency bonus to the number of key points that you have, you know, that table where it's two per level, maybe it's that plus your proficiency bonus, your wisdom modifier, just to give you a little bit more, maybe an innate ability to, similar to a wizard's arcane recovery, to get some key points back uh, on a short rest, although again, actually, never mind, you get them all back on a short rest, this would have to be something you could do relatively quick to just get a couple back, um, maybe something similar to the updated paladin's ability to get kind of a channel, uh, you know, spell slots back with channel divinity, I don't know, uh, again, we'll see, and seemingly in about one to two weeks time, we think that the, uh, warrior subclass, or the warrior class grouping, for the one D&D playtest will be available to us. We think that's going to be the next one. There's nothing really to base that off of. But if that's the case, we'll get to see possibly what the plans are for future monks in the one D&D slash whatever we're going to end up calling it in the future. Uh, so I'm curious to see how this magic item list will survive the next version of the playtest. So. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to Eventier Games once again for sponsoring this video. And a shout out to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. I will see you all next time.